There was a family that was um, watching a dramatization of the life of Jesus on television uh, in that <coughs> season, that weekend of Easter. And the youngest child was down in front of the television set watching and, and was completely mesmerized and moved by the events that she watched on the television as Jesus struggled toward Calvary under the weight of the cross. Tears, tears formed in her eyes and rolled down her little cheeks. And she was absolutely silent and still as Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and laid in the tomb. And then, suddenly, she turned around to the rest of her family with glee, exclaimed, Now comes the good part! <laughs> That's Easter. That's Easter. The good part. You see, there's something, there's something about the way that we are created. There is something about the human heart, the human soul, that roots for resurrection. If you don't believe me, look at the response to the fire at Notre Dame this week. Until the fire, they'd been trying to renovate that great old cathedral, and the renovations were going very slowly because there was, there was frustration about the fundraising that was taking place. And it was the fundraising wasn't going well, and the work kept starting and stopping because funds would run out over and over. There was just a little bit here and a little bit there, and so they were doing the renovations patchwork style. But then, then she burned. Magnificently into the night, the fire's glow in the darkness appeared as though it were completely consuming that great 850-year-old Gothic cathedral. But as morning dawned, there was hopeful news. Remember Wednesday morning? The walls and the towers of the cathedral had been saved as were priceless pieces of art and religious relics. And what happened right after that? Pledges started pouring in. The first one was $100 million for the renovation of the cathedral, and that was followed up very quickly with another gift from a very wealthy benefactor of $250 million, another $50 million, another $10 million, and by week's end, by week's end, the donations topped a billion dollars, enough to completely rebuild and renovate the great cathedral. But, but whoa, 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 it's better. <laughs> We're not to the good part yet, Vic. <laughs> Did you hear the news? Donations now have started to come in for those three historically black churches that were burned in Louisiana earlier this month. Before, before Tuesday's fire in Paris, only $100,000 had been raised for all three of those churches. But just since Tuesday, another $2 million has come in to help in the restoration efforts of those churches. I think... I think something is happening because the human soul is created to root for resurrection. We will not let ashes be the final story because, you see, we, we hope for the good part. Isn't that, isn't that why we're here this morning? Now comes the good part. Hear the story again from the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter, beginning at the first verse. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guard shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has been raised as he said. 
Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he's been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him. This is my message for you. And so they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The word of God from the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before Jesus was betrayed by Judas's kiss, before Jesus was arrested, he prayed in the darkened garden at Gethsemane saying those words that we've all heard ourselves praying in some moment or another, those words, not my will, but thine be done. And hearing Jesus pray those words on that night, praying that the cup might be lifted from him, that he might be able to escape from the mission that lay before him, we might conclude that Jesus was speaking of God's will for his death. God's will for him to experience suffering and to, to die by crucifixion. But now as we arrive at Easter, I hear that same phrase so differently. We arrive at Easter, you see, and we learn that death is never God's will. That the cross and the suffering and the abuse was not God's will. See, today, today on Easter morning, we get it. We understand God's will is not death, never is. God's will is life and always has been. Since the very day of creation, God's will has been for life. And so God's will for us today is life. Not only, not only in the here and now, but life for all of eternity. You see, Easter, Easter is God's glorious response to everything that the world gets so wrong. It's God's response to pain and suffering and oppression and hostility and darkness and death and ashes. God answers with an empty tomb and the light of dawn and resurrection because God is the God of life. And if we, if we are created, as scripture suggests, if we are created in God's image, is it any wonder that we are created with something, something in our center, something in the human heart, something in the human soul that longs for and roots for resurrection. That longs for life. Let me tell you a story. There was a man who got up, was listening to the radio one Saturday morning, had his coffee, had his newspaper, and then there was one of those morning call-in talk shows that was on. And a, and a congenial host was visiting with a caller named Tom. Well, Tom, the host said, sure sounds like you're awful busy with your job. It's a shame. It's a shame you had to be away from home and your family so much. I know how much you hated to miss your daughter's dance recital. But let me tell you something, Tom. Something that has helped me keep a good perspective on my own priorities. And with that, the host continued to explain his theory of a thousand marbles. He said, Tom, you see, I, I sat down one day and I did a little arithmetic. The average person lives 75 years. Oh, I know, I know, some, 
Some live more than that, some live less. But on average, folks live about 75 years. Now I multiply 75 times 52. And I came up with a number, Tom, 3,900. That's the number of Saturdays that the average person has in their entire lifetime. Now stick with me, Tom. It took me until I was 55 years old to think about all of this in any detail. And by that time, I had lived through over 2,800 Saturdays. And I got to thinking, I got to thinking that if I lived to be 75, well, then I only had about a thousand of those Saturdays left to enjoy. Do you know what I did, Tom? I went to a toy store and I bought every single marble they had. In fact, I ended up going to three toy stores so that I could round up about a, a thousand marbles. And I took them and I, I put them inside of a big container that I keep right here in my studio so that when I do my Saturday morning broadcast, every Saturday since then, I take out a marble. I take out one of those marbles and I throw it away. And I found that watching those marbles disappear I began to focus more on the things that were truly important to me in my life. You know, there's nothing like watching your time run out right in front of your eyes to help your priorities get straight. <coughs> Tom, I began to concentrate on the things that add to my life rather than take away from it. Well, Tom, one last thing before I sign off with you and all our listener friends and go take my lovely wife out for breakfast. Now, this morning, Tom, I took the very last marble out of that container and I threw it away. I figure if I make it until next Saturday, and God has blessed me with a little extra time to be with those that I love. It's sure been good talking to you, Tom. Who knows? Maybe we'll get to talk again, the Lord willing. Have a truly blessed morning, friends. You know, you could have heard a pin drop when the announcer finished. There was a man that listened to that broadcast. He was planning to do some work that morning. Thought maybe he'd do a little work and then head out for a round of golf with his buddies. But at that moment, he chose instead to go upstairs and wake up his wife with a kiss. Good morning, honey. <laughs> hey, come on. What do you say I take you and the kids out for breakfast? Oh, what brought this on? She asked with a smile. He said, oh, eh, nothing special, he said. It just seems to me it's been a long time since we spent a Saturday together. And then with a twinkle in his eye that she hadn't seen for a long time, he said, and I, I, if you don't mind while we're out, I'd like to stop by a toy store or two. <clears throat> you see, each one of us has a choice. Either to get caught up in, in the humdrum of life and worried about the scarcity of life, even spending all of our days and all of our hours that are allotted to us, either, either treading away or indulging ourselves. But that's not what we were created for. We were created for life. We were created for the good part. <laughs> created for the life that Jesus himself promised, the abundant life. The life that really is life. And Easter, Easter, you see, it calls us to discover 
that, that abundant life where we thought only the ashes of despair existed. Easter calls us to participate in those things that are life-giving, things that are hope-building, things that are future-making, those activities that bring us at last closer to God's reality where abundant life is possible. Easter calls to us, calls to us to reach out to old hurts, act compassionately toward one another, to live and love, not just, not just in thought and emotion, but in, in act and deed. The world could become more compassionate as we exercise compassion till that day will come where we will no longer hear news like we heard this morning from Sri Lanka. Till the day when we are all drawn into the abundant life that God makes possible. Easter calls to us. It calls to us to remodel our interiors and to accept God's help to break addictions and to quit harmful behaviors and rediscover a love for ourselves that perhaps has been so long neglected we can't even, can't even fathom it anymore. Easter calls to us. Easter calls to us to regain the vision of what could be. Easter calls to us to reach out, to reach out to neighbors and acquaintances when, when our busyness and our own self-centeredness causes us to neglect others, to form community, the parcel of peace and comfort that, that draws us into life, the life that really is life. Easter calls to us, not just this morning, but every morning, Easter calls to us to renew our faith, to discover the meaning and the purpose of our lives as we are connected to the one who authored and offered us life. Easter calls us to a relationship with the one who says, I am resurrection. I and life. The Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let's stand. Let's sing.